let's get started. I'm gonna go through the same topic. I'm gonna go through it a little bit faster just to remind ourselves of what we were trying to do. We started with the skip gram model. So for each word in our vocabulary, we are gonna have a vector representation, actually two vector representations. One is the input vector representation and one is the output vector representation. These are the parameters of our model. Now, whenever you're doing machine learning and deep learning, you need to write a loss function. And this is our loss function. We want to maximize the probability of the words that are appearing in the context of the word that we are interested in. For instance, if you're interested in WT and the word is representation, you want to increase the probability of distributed, of words, etc., and at the same time, decrease the probability of the words that do not appear in the context. So that's your loss function. Once you minimize this loss function with respect to the word representations, then in the end, you're going to be able to represent each single word in your vocabulary with a vector that knows about its neighborhood words. And that's how the meaning is going to get transformed, transferred from one document to the next document. And each word is going to have its own uh, meaning depending on the context around it. So I mentioned that you can represent the words in your dictionary as numbers. This is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Another way to represent it is you have a long vector of the size of your vocabulary. And the first entry for, let's say, the word distributed is one, and the rest of them are zeros. And this is going to be called one hot vector. So there is only one hot location that it is one, and the rest of it is zeros. For one hot vector, the question is, is the, in, is the input word and projection the one hot vectors? So yeah, that's where I'm trying to go with this figure. What does this projection mean? Because in this figure, you're seeing the word projection, but what does it mean? So each word is going to be a one hot vector. And wherever uh, you have the location corresponding to this word, there is going to be a one. Otherwise, it's going to be zero. For instance, if representations is a word in your vocabulary, and let's say it is the 121th word in your vocabulary, there is going to be a one at the 121th location of that vector, and then it's going to be zeros everywhere. That's how you're representing WTs. So you, you can represent WTs, uh, you can think of them as either indices, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, or you can think of them as one hot vectors. Okay. If you take a one hot vector and multiply it by a matrix of your word embeddings, that's going to get projected into the word vectors that we are interested in. And because it's a one hot vector, it's going to choose the corresponding column of that uh, word embedding matrix. So whenever I say word embedding, that corresponds to your dictionary. Okay, and that's exactly what we are looking after, we are looking for. We are looking for vector representations for our words. So there are two ways to, to think about it, and that's why we call it projection, because you're actually multiplying a very long vector that is sparse by a matrix, and then you are projecting it into a lower dimension. Okay, for instance, WT could be one million dimensional, of which is a sparse vector, and then you are multiplying it by a matrix and then projecting it into uh, maybe 100 dimensions. Okay, from 1 million dimension, you're going to 100 dimension. But in the end, don't worry about that. In the end, you can think of them as indices. And for each index, you're going to have a vector. Regardless of how you came up with this vector, you came up with it through a matrix vector multiplication, or you came up with it with just indices. For each word, for each index, you're going to have a vector. For distributed, you have a vector corresponding to distributed. And these are now full vectors. They are not sparse. Okay, These are not one hot vectors anymore. Now you have an input representation. You have an output representation corresponding to this word and this word. And uh, you can think of this dot product as a distance. So this is what I didn't tell you last session. But you can also think of it as a distance. This is not the Euclidean distance, uh, but you can think of it as a distance. So you are sort of computing the distance between two words, and you can think of this as cosine similarity distance. 
you are computing the distance between two words, this word and that word, and then you are turning that into probabilities using the softmax operation. So this softmax is going to turn a number that is from negative infinity to positive infinity to be from zero to one. That's cool. Another property is if you do a summation over all of your inputs, over all of your output uh, vectors, over, over all of your output indices, then the numerator and denominator are going to cancel out. It's going to become one. It means that the summation is also one. So not only it gives you a probability, it's going to give you a probability distribution over your words. Okay. That's why if you increase one of these probabilities, you are decreasing the rest of them because they have to add up to one. There are a bunch of positive numbers from zero to one. They add up to one. If you increase one of them, the rest of them should compensate for it and go, go down. That's how if you increase the probability of the words in the context of representations, if you increase the probability of this word and the other words, the probabilities of the rest of the words in your vocabulary that are not appearing in the context are going down because they have to add up to one. Uh, and there is a difference between your corpus. This is the entire corpus. And these are all of the words that are appearing in your cor corpus. And uh, let's say that's the size of T. C is the size of your context. So this is a hyperparameter. The size that you choose for these vectors is another hyperparameter. And the size of your vocabulary, what words do you want to include in your vocabulary, is another hyperparameter that you can choose. And the parameters are these V and V primes. And if you want to relate WI and WO with, the, with this figure, WI is this WT and WO is any of these outputs. And the size of your vocabulary is usually much smaller than the size of your corpus, okay? Because the same word can appear in multiple sentences and in multiple documents. This is the input representation. So for each word, you're gonna have an input representation and output representation. In the end, you can either choose VW as your word representations once the training is done, or you can use V prime, or you can add them and divide them by two, and that could be your representation. So okay? are, are the parameters that we're learning using this loss function, are they, the like matrices that give us the input to input vector representation and input to output. Uh, can you say it again? What do you mean? Well, so like in this like deep learning model, like the the parameters that we're updating according to that loss function in the top left are they, for example, the the matrix that takes our one hot vector and transforms it into a into whatever projection we want. Yes, so you can think of it that way as well. Okay. So let's say you have a dictionary of words and let's sort them and let's say the entire dictionary that you're gonna have are these words, distributed representation of words and phrases and their compositionality. Okay, so and is appearing twice, so we are gonna include it only once. So this is the first word, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so I'm ignoring and here, seven and eight, okay? That's your vocabulary. And let's, you can assume that you can have a matrix. These are your rows, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. And then for each row, you're gonna have a vector. You're gonna have a vector corresponding to the first row, a vector corresponding to the second row. Now, if you stack everything on top of each other, that's gonna give you a matrix. So you can either think of it in terms of matrices or you can think of it in terms of individual vectors. How many columns would it have? That's a hyperparameter that you choose. That's a great question. That's the dimensionality reduction that you're doing here. That's a hyperparameter. You can have 100, you can have 256, you can have 1024, etc. But if you want to reduce the dimension, you necessarily want it to be less than the number of rows? No, it's actually, yes, it's going to be less than the, num the number of rows. Because the number of rows is the size of your vocabulary. It's W. And then you want to project from a very long vector to a shorter vector, maybe 100 or 256. Does that answer your question? And yes, Sagi is right. The matrix that we are explaining is the learnable parameters. 
So these are your word representations. Each row of that matrix is going to be a representation of that corresponding word. So is everything clear now? I think that's clear. And, and just one other question about that. Like there's two sort of, like in the simplest model, there would be sort of two, there would be the, the matrix to project our input word into some input vector representation. And then there would be another matrix to project that input vector representation into our output vector representation. Yes, that's exactly right. So you're gonna have one matrix here we can call it a capital V matrix. And the entries of that capital V matrix are these small VWIs. And then the output matrix is going to be V prime. And its entries, its rows are these vectors. OK, thanks. So yes. And there are a couple of questions on the chat. So the embedding matrix starts with random values. Yes, so the embedding matrix starts with random values and then throughout the training, they're gonna, by maximizing your likelihood, in the end, you're gonna end up with meaningful word representations. Initially, they are random. And there is a question, uh, so one row per word, but the column number is variable. Exactly. So you're gonna have one row per word and the column number is what you choose is the dimension of these vectors. And yes, the embedding matrix starts with random values, but then you do the optimization and then they're gonna go in the correct location. They're gonna have meaning. I have a question in regards to the embedding. Um, I've seen a bunch of um, visualization that you can visualize the worlds next to each other on a 2D plane. So I'm wondering how big is the dimensionality that you actually use in, um, I guess, the industry? That depends. That depends on your corpus size. The more words that you have, the more uh, words in your corpus. The, the bigger the size of your corpus, the larger you can set these, the dimensionality of your vector representations. Uh, it could be 100, it could be 256, 1024, and you can double that each time, okay? I think it's around 1024 recently that people are using but it could even get bigger, depending on the size of your corpus. Any other questions? Okay, so this was another way of looking at the same context from last time. So last time I was thinking of these WTs as indices. Now I'm thinking of them as one hot vectors. And what you're learning is this matrix that is doing the projection, you can call it V, and then there is gonna be another matrix that is doing the, uh, that is increasing the dimension. This one is decreasing the dimension. The other one is increasing the dimension back to one hot vectors. But when you want to implement it, this is exactly what you do. You're going to think of WTs as uh, indices because you don't want to store long and large sparse matrices and vectors, okay? Because the number of words in your vocabulary could be a lot. And then we are actually adding even more words to our vocabulary. For instance, something like New York Times has its own meaning. If you break it apart, like New York, New York time, then it's gonna be meaningless. It's the phrase, the entire phrase that has a meaning. And the way that you do it is you do, this is just a pre-processing step on your data. You go through your corpus, you look at the words that are next to each other, you count them, you divide them by their individual appearances, and then you put a threshold. If this is bigger than or equal to that threshold, you include that pair of words as a single word in your, in your vocabulary. So you're gonna have an additional row in your word embedding matrix for that word. And then you do it a couple of passes. If you do it a second pass, you're gonna get New York Times. But there was a problem. The problem is that uh, computing this softmax is very costly. You're gonna have to write a for loop and that for loop is gonna have 10 million iterations. And you're doing it per each word, per each input word, per each pair of input and output word. So it's gonna be a lot of for loops and it's very slow. There is a way to reduce the computational cost from W to log two of W. And whenever you see log two, there is a tree behind it. So that's a tree. So one thing that we are doing here is trading off computational cost for more memory. Previously, per each word, you had a word vector. Now, not only for each word, you have a word vector, 
but for each node in your graph, you're gonna have a vector, and these are gonna be your V primes. So let's go through this uh, tree a little bit. What is N? N is gonna represent your node. W is gonna tell us that we are interested in this word, and J is gonna tell us uh, what node on the path are we on, on the path to W are we on. For instance, NW1 is the first one, NW2 is the second one, NW3 and NW4 is the last guy, it's the word that you're interested in. LW is the length of your word. Uh, so I'm gonna answer your question shortly. The question is, what does a node represent? I'm gonna tell you shortly. So LW is the length of this graph. And in our case, it's gonna be one, two, three, and plus one. So it's gonna be four. LW is four. And W1 is the root. And W4 is the actual word that we are interested in. That's the last node. That's your leaf of the tree. CHN, N is your node. CH is a particular child that you choose. Maybe your favorite child is your left child. So you choose it, that's a convention, and you fix it. So let's say it's our left child. Is there a reason we don't zero index? Uh, not really, you could. It might actually be better because if you zero index, NW3 is the word that you're interested in. But uh, we are gonna take care of that by subtracting a one later on. Yeah. And then you have it, these double brackets. They are just turning true and falses to ones and negative ones. This is the functionality of this double bracket. Why did I go through that pain of introducing that notation? Because in the end, you want to represent the probability in a mathematical way. And that's the mathematical formulation. But let's go through the intuition through this example. At each node, you have the choice. You can say, I'm going to flip a coin. And then if the coin is coming up head, I'm going to the left. If it's coming up tail, I'm going to the right. And the probability of going to the left is going to be a sigmoid. The sigmoid function is a function that is like S. It takes value from uh, 0 to 1. So it's basically mapping negative infinity to positive infinity to a number from 0 to 1. Okay, So that's our sigmoid function. We take the dot product of the input word. This is exactly what we were doing here as well, the dot product of the input word. But this time, you're going to multiply it by the representation, by the vector representation of this node. And then you push it through a sigmoid function. And that's going to give you the probability of going to the left. I guess that's going to answer your question, what does a node represent? We are going to have a representation for each node because it's going to give us the probability. It's going to help us decide whether we should go left or whether we should go right. And if we go left, then this half of the graph, we can just ignore. So you're ignoring half of your words right away. You don't need to consider them. So half of your dictionary, the size of your dictionary is now reduced by half. So it's massive. And that's where the computational gain is coming from. So as soon as you decide to go left, you're going to ignore everything to the right. Now for the next round, on the path from the root to the word, uh, because the path is going to the right, we need to know what is the probability of going to the right. The probability of going to the right is 1 minus the probability of going to the left. But there is a nice property for sigmoid function, and that is 1 minus sigma of x is equal to sigma of negative x. That's why we are putting, putting sigma of negative x here. This is basically equal to one minus sigma of this term. That's why we are introducing this uh, double bracket notation because it's gonna tell us, should you put a plus one here or a negative one here? Now you put a negative one there, that's gonna give you the probability of going to the right. So now the probability of going to the left at this node is very similar to what we did before because we are going to the left, there is a plus one here. And in the end, the probability of seeing this word is the multiplication of a bunch of sigmoids. So what is the probability of going left? What is the probability of going right? What is the probability of going left? Multiply them together, and that's gonna give you the probability of ending at this leaf node. Now the question is, how do we make this tree? It doesn't really matter. No matter how you build a tree, as soon as you have a tree, you are gonna reduce the computational cost from W 
to log two of w. So it doesn't really matter how you build the tree. But if you build it smartly, you can uh, be lucky or in expectation, get better performance than log two of w. So in expectation, you can get better performance if you assign shorter routes, shorter path to more frequent words. Because these words that are appearing more frequent, uh, you're going to see them more. So for them, you're taking shorter path to compute the probabilities. And for the ones that are seeing less frequently, you're taking a longer path. But that's OK. Because you see them less frequently, uh, it's not going to affect your computational cost that much in expectation. OK, whenever you're studying the computational cost of an algorithm, you can look at the worst case scenario, the best case scenario, and the average case scenario. So the average case scenario is actually better than like two if you do binary Hoffman trees. So there is a question. OK, uh, so there is another question. So under root, we keep the most frequent word. No, it's not on the root. All of the words are at the leaf. The nodes are just there to help you decide, should I go to the left or should I go to the right? So you are not putting any words on your nodes. You are putting your words here at your leaves of the tree. Does that answer your question? So why are you sacrificing uh, some of the, basically you are trading off computational efficiency for memory efficiency. So now you have to store vector representations for each one of your nodes. So you need to store V prime of NW1, V prime of NW2. And are those learned? Yes, they are learned. These are okay. parameters. Okay, so it's initially initialized so that everything Randomly. has like an even probability. Um, and then over time, we want to, according to that loss function, we update it appropriately. Exactly, yes. Okay. That's correct. Any other questions? Uh, it feels like there still there will still be uh, 10 to the power 5 times 10 to the power 5 if the number of words in the vocabulary is 10 to the power 5 uh, times will calculate the probability, right? Because we're calculating P of a given word given an input word. That isn't changing. Uh, no, that's not changing. So there is, this, there is going to be this summation still, which you can do mini batching. So I'm not worried about that summation. There is going to be this summation that you still need to do. Per each input word, you're going to have, let's say, four output words. So you still need to do that summation. But then this summation here, we are getting rid of it. Rather than doing a for loop with W iterations, you can do a for loop with log two W iterations. Okay, So that's what we are reducing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It turns out that you can actually do better than this by sacrificing it doesn't have to be exact probabilities for this algorithm to work. You can have approximations to this probability. And it can actually do better. We can reduce the cost even further. And we're going to see how. There is this idea of negative sampling. And negative sampling says uh, it's actually an old idea. It's noise contrastive estimation, NCE. And the idea is that a model or a good model should be able to tell the difference between noise and data by using only logistic regression. And logistic regression is a classical machine learning algorithm. It was a prerequisite for this course. Uh, but even if you don't have that, I'm going to explain it in the next line. But the big picture is that a good model, for those of you who know logistic regression, it should be able to differentiate data from noise. And that's, a, that's exactly what we need. Let's see why. In the end, we are interested in the log of P of WO given WI. So we are interested in that. You can try to do this. You can try to increase the probability. So this is just the probability of the words that are appearing in the context. So you're increasing those probabilities. So this is data. This WO is data because it is in the context. So let's say you choose representations as your input word your output word is distributed because it is in the context. That's a positive example. That's data. And because it is data, we want to increase the, its probability. So we want to increase the probability of data, the positive examples. But then if you show an algorithm only positive examples, it's not going to know when it's making mistakes. So the algorithm needs to learn from its 
successes and its failures. So we need to tell it what's a failure. So how do you tell it what's a failure? You go in your corpus, you choose a random word. That random word, its probability of showing up in your context is very low. So that's probably a negative example. So we are going to show it noises. So we are going to show it positive examples and negative examples. You are increasing the probability of positive examples and decreasing the probability of negative examples. So this minus sign is helping you decrease those probabilities. And these are negative examples. So show it a couple of positive examples, show it a couple of negative examples, and the algorithm should be able to differentiate positive versus negative and then you can just optimize it. And now what is the cost now per each log of PWO given WI? The cost is just a for loop of size K and K you choose. It could be as low as uh, 10 examples or 100 negative examples, okay? So you show it one positive example and a couple of negative examples. And how do you choose your noise? You can look at the unigram distribution. What is a unigram? A unigram is just your words, for instance, distributed, representation of words and phrases. These are your unigrams. A bigram is every pair of word, distributed representation, representations of, of words, words and, and phrases. So you're gonna take a look at all of the words and then you can create a histogram of uh, how many times the word of appeared in your corpus, how many times the word words appeared in your corpus. That's going to give you a distribution. You can sample from that, but it turns out that you need to downweight the more frequent words in your dictionary, in your corpus, because usually they don't convey much information like and, of, their, and. These are not that much informative compared to distributed representations and compositionality or phrases. Okay. The power three over four is another hyperparameter that you choose. So this model has a lot of hyperparameters. There is one here. You can choose K, the size of your input and output vector representations. That's another hyperparameter. So these are the choices that you're making. That's a great question. Why don't we just pre-process the corpus in the first place to remove words like and, of, etc.? Even if you remove words of words like of, and, et cetera, that was just an example that I was saying. Even if you remove them, there is still gonna be some words that are more frequent in your vocabulary that are appearing uh, a lot of times in the corpus, okay? That's for taking care of them. And what you just said is very important. There is gonna be an imbalance between rare words, for instance, uh, the name of a person, it could be a rare word, or some words that are like New York Times. That could be a rare word. It's not appearing that many times. That depends on the context. And you're gonna have some frequent words. And there is usually an imbalance with them. So there is another technique. Whenever you choose a word for training, you're gonna discard it with some probability that is a function of the frequency of that word in your corpus. The more frequent the word is, this is gonna increase the denominator is increasing. The numerator is just a number that you're choosing, let's say 10 to the power negative five, another hyperparameter. If this increases the frequency of a word, if a word is more frequent, this is going to go towards zero. And then the probability of dropping that word is gonna increase. So you're gonna drop the words. It's as if you're pre-processing your corpus, okay? So the more frequent a word is, the higher its pro probability of dropping. So the question is, should we drop it uh, before this? Yes. So whenever you choose a word, you're gonna drop it with this probability. And as I said, the threshold is 10 to the power negative five, and the frequency is just the frequency. And uh, so whenever you write a machine learning algorithm, you need to know what is your data. You need to write a model to explain the data. You need to write the loss function to minimize or you need to have an objective function to maximize. And at the same time, you need to somehow evaluate it. How can I tell that this word vector representation is a good one? How can we judge its quality? Yes, you just told me a lot of math, but uh, what you actually come up with, is it actually good? How can I evaluate it? 
So evaluation is very important in machine learning, okay? How are we gonna evaluate this? There is this task of syntactic and semantic analogies. So this is actually a test for some of you that took GRE. You need to know this word is related to that word, and this is similar to the relationship of another word to what, and that's the question that you're gonna ask your algorithm. Now that you have vector representations, and let's say your analogy task is Berlin to Germany is similar to France to what? That's the question that you're asking. Berlin to Germany is similar to France to what? And the answer is Paris. And the algorithm should be able to tell us Paris. And the number of times that is successful compared to the times, the number of times that is not successful is gonna give you a metric to evaluate the goodness of your algorithm, okay? Is this a way to say, um, so are we basically looking for the distance between Berlin and Germany to be similar to the distance between France and Netherwood? Exactly. Now that uh, before, before this trouble, before having a vector representation for your words, there was no way for the computer to be able to compare these. Okay? But now there is chance. You look at Berlin. Berlin is an index in your dictionary. You look up uh, Berlin in your word representation or your word embedding matrix, that's gonna give you a vector. Now that you have a vector, distances make sense for computers, okay? Now you have a bunch of numbers. You can subtract the vector representation of Germany from Berlin, add France, and then compare the distance between this vector and another vector, and you're looking for a word in your dictionary. So you're gonna go through your dictionary and choose the one that is minimizing this distance. And it turns out that yes, the algorithm is most of the time successful. It's gonna give you Paris, okay? So that's actually a good algorithm. Any questions before I move on? Yeah, so do you compare every word um, in the last part, vector W, or do you just calculate the distance between Berlin and Germany and then find the distance um, from fans of all of those words that are that distance? So this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna create a vector representation for Berlin. You're gonna subtract the vector representation of Germany from Berlin. You're gonna add the vector representation of France to whatever that you had already. And then the word that you're interested in should be closest to this. And that's the one that you're gonna report. And by the way, this is a semantic analogy task. You can have syntactic analogy tasks as well. And there is a question from Sabrina. Theoretically, this could work for any language. Yes. So this can work for any language, for Chinese or uh, any other language. And there are actually papers that are doing that. Actually, the second speaker in the, that we have invited is an expert for multilingual natural language processing. So if you're interested in that, you should attend that one. Any other questions? I just wanted to check my understanding for... Uh, given this hierarchical softmax um, during backpropagation, the only nodes we need to update or the only vectors we need to update are the ones along the given path. Is that correct? Yes, and those you know because you know your training data. So these are going to get updated per each backpropagation. Okay. You're right. I think we are finishing right on time. For those of you who have questions and want to stay and ask, I'll be around. And for those of you who want to leave, you have classes, et cetera, you can leave now. Someone asked uh, earlier about uh, visualization. And I was curious if you could use something like TSNE for visualizing like the output of this network, like it, related words or related words having like related similar vectors in this like visualization space, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. This is very nice now, now that you turn your words to vectors, you can do whatever that you want to do with them. Whenever you have a vector, you can do operations on it. For instance, you can do TSNE, et cetera, and try to visualize these vectors. And you can actually visualize this in a nice way. You can have arrows and you can say, okay, these types of words are closer to each other. And those types of words are creating a cluster. Mm -hmm. and then so there are these nice visualizations. And TSNE would allow you to like embed that in a lower dimensional space. So and take a look at it, yes. So okay. you can actually perfectly, it's perfectly fine. You can look at the words in your dictionary and try to plot them. And okay. some nice patterns are gonna come out of that. 
That's cool. So the question is when we are done learning the vectors internally in the tree, how do we extract the vectors for the leaves? Oh, these, just, you, these are the parameters that you know. So in the end, what you're gonna end up with are a bunch of Vs and for each word, you're gonna have a V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, V7, V8, and a bunch of V primes on your notes. So the V primes you can discard and Vs you're gonna keep because these are these vector representations in the end. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? Now the V primes um, relating to the frequency of the words, so you'll know um, to go left or right. Uh, you mean here? Yeah, I think so. When you, well, when Actually, you, uh, you can take it to construct your binary Hoffman tree. You can look at the frequency of the words. Yeah. And then the more frequent ones are going to have shorter path. But what I just told you in this slide is that there are three ways to write down your loss function. One was this, which is very slow. There is going to be the hierarchical softmax, which is helping us a little bit, but not too much. But then there is negative sampling, which is going to help us a lot. This is actually what you're going to use in practice. This is the fastest. This is not perfect. There is approximations going on here, but this is good enough to give you good representations. And the cost is very low. It's just a for loop over K items. We could use both though, right? I mean, you could use negative sampling in a hierarchical softmax or no. Well, the negative sampling already takes into the hierarchical, right? The hierarchical softmax? Uh, no. No. It's not doing it. Yeah. So this is very simple. It's uh, a binary classification task. You're doing, you're differentiating between data versus noise. Oh, this is data because it appeared in the context. This is a positive example. This is a negative example. So you show it a bunch of positive and negative examples. So no, there is no trees going on here. Can we use them both simultaneously though? Uh, you could, but I don't see why would you do that? Because this is already fast enough. Okay. Okay, this is really fast. It's just uh, extremely fast. It's so much better than log two of W. In the negative sampling, um, for example, if we were looking at the title, we were looking at the word distributed, then if our context is, I don't know, C is two, then positive examples would be representation and of, and negative examples would be everything outside of that? Exactly, yes, you're correct. So representation and off are in the context of distributed. These are positive examples. And anything else, you're going to sample from them at random. You're going to sample maybe two of them or three of them and show it to the algorithm. And so when you do this for a word, would you look at just the single instance of the word? Or would you look at maybe all um, instances of the word in your entire corpus? Uh, it's going to be your entire corpus. So you go, your, you go through your corpus in an order, let's say you pick a word in the first sentence of the first document, you look at its neighborhoods and write down that loss function for it. And then you add to it a bunch of, uh, you go to the next word, you do the same thing. And the thing is that this WT could be appearing in different documents and in different sentences. Okay, so you could be seeing that multiple times. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I was wondering, so in the regular softmax, we basically get a probability of a word being in the context of another word. In the negative sampling, we have a model that will learn its parameters that does the same thing using noise. Is that correct? Yes, so that's correct. Okay, so how do we, I guess, how do we, do we have to rebuild the data set for training that model or is it all part of the process? So let's see the difference between the script gram model, the hierarchical softmax, and negative sampling. So here, you're only showing it positive examples. You don't need to show it negative examples. Why? Because underneath, there is this constraint on the objective that if you increase the probability of the ones in the context, the ones that are not in the context are going to go down automatically because those probabilities have to add up to one. Okay. Same thing here, these probabilities, they are gonna add up to one. The proof is a little bit more complex, but they are gonna add up to one. It's gonna give you a probability distribution. But for negative sampling, you need it to show it negative examples. If you show it only positive examples, it's just gonna increase the probability of positive examples towards one. And then uh, 
nothing is going to happen. The algorithm is not going to learn anything. Okay. So for these two cases, this case and hierarchical softmax, you don't need to show it negative examples. Does that answer your question? I think so. So how do we, so do we have to start by training this negative sampling logistic regression model first? So in practice, what the algorithm is going to end up using is this negative sampling. And that's one, what's, what is going to give you word to VEC algorithm. So the algorithm that we have is word to VEC, and it's going to use negative sampling. But I had to go through this pain to tell you that this is just an approximation. So we are sacrificing something. So I'm just a bit confused. So we're using the loss function to see how good our model is. But then we're introducing another model, which is the negative sampling to this model to simplify the softmax. So I wasn't sure if do we have to turn the negative sampling model first and then turn the, um, the initial skip-fair model? Or is it all part of the process? No. So I guess there is a confusion here. The skip gram model is this figure, and there is going to be one over t. That's your loss function of this summation. That summation is still there. So you are looking at the context. And then there are three ways to represent log of p of w given the other w. Okay. This is the first way. This is the second way, the hierarchical softmax, which is this formula here. And there is a third way, which is an approximation. And we are going to use the third way in practice. So the negative sampling is just a part of our loss function. That's part of your loss function, yes. So you write down that, and log of p of wt plus j given wt is this term here. So do we, okay, so, so we learn the loss function while we're training the model. No, you're not learning the loss function. Your loss function is fixed. That's your loss function. What you're learning are these, double, these Vs, your vector representations. So how do we get the noise? How do we know how to choose the noise? The noise distribution is exactly, I guess it was you who mentioned it. Anything that's not in the context is going to be a word that's noise. So for instance, these phrases here is noise for the word distributed. Okay. okay. And the way that you sample it is, uh, this is your sampling probability. You just sample at random according to this distribution. That's going to give you the noise distribution. That makes a lot of sense. So do you have to keep um, a data set of which words are in the context of other words and which words are part of the noise distribution? Exactly, yes. And you can actually do it on the fly. You pick this word, you know its context, so that's a positive example, and you sample another word from your cor corpus, that's going to be a negative example. But how do you know that compositionality is not in the next sentence next to distributed? It could be. So you could be making mistakes. And that's why it's an approximation. Oh, okay. Maybe in one of your corpus, in one of the sentences, is one in one of your documents, you have distributed compositionality. But uh, this is a statistical framework. Okay, it's not going to be perfect. So do you only use um, a sentence at a time for the noise distribution? Uh, you use a sentence at a time or multiple sentences at a time. You do it in mini batches. Okay, cool. Makes a lot of sense. So you don't have to do the summation over your entire corpus. You can do your summation 10 sentences at a time or 100 sentences at a time, etc. I think I got it. Thanks a lot. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. When you say syntactic um, evaluation, what would that look like? Uh, for instance, go to going is similar to dance to, dance. and the answer is dancing. Okay. Okay. That's syntactic. So you would do like dance my, or go minus going plus dance, and you would hope that it would come up with dancing. Exactly, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank and you. And it's going to actually come up with that. That we're going to see next session. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I, I actually, and so the, the goal of this model is simply to understand word representation and word phrases. Uh, yes. So the goal is uh, you want to find a way for computers to understand words and their meaning. For instance, there's semantic sim similarity or, semant or syntactic similarity between words. Okay. So the, the end result of this is just the, the model can make analogies between words and that shows that it is as a strong grasp of what, how words are similar. Yes. What is the similarity between words? 
how they are related. And, that, and that's exactly what uh, humans do. So we don't understand words as single tones. We understand them in uh, context. For instance, bank could have different meanings according to the context. It could be where you put the money or it could be near the beach or near the sea. It could have different meanings depending okay. on the context. So if you want, then would you hope that if you compared like bank to money, it would be similar to something? I mean, could you make that comparison and see if it would get the contextual thing you're comparing it to? Yes. But then these are all uh, examples that you are checking your algorithm on, but you want your algorithm to be good on average. That's why you have a data set. It's going to be a test data set that you're going to test the performance of your algorithm. And then it's going to be, I don't know, 80% accurate. So 80% of the times it's correct and 20% of the times it's failing. Okay. So it's a statistical algorithm. It's not going to be perfect. Cool. Thank you. Even humans are not perfect. If you think about it, they're going to make mistakes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. See you later. See you.